Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway, as always, is everyone's favorite data philosopher, Andy Leonard. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, my voice is still a little bit rough, but uh, I've been dealing with the, uh, I think a plague has descended upon my house. <laughs> I am sorry to hear that. It's a bad time of year for that on the East Coast, which not many people know this, but the East Coast of the United States probably has the worst air quality when it comes to natural causes, things like pollen, uh, maybe anywhere on the planet. I could totally see that. I could totally see that. I um. Uh, I also blame the kids. <laughs> kids are like little bioweapons factories. Like the, that's not school that they go to, man. That's they, they probably like have like this like secret lab in the basement where they work on bioweapons. <laughs> they certainly do pick things up and bring them home. Um, that's that's one advantage of homeschooling. And we have three here at home uh, doing homeschooling is they have to do a little bit extra work to bring the diseases back to the house. <laughs> so I wanted to let you know, Frank, I've changed my do- my job title. I-, I loved being a data philosopher, and I still feel like I am, but the official job title was changed just a couple of days ago. Oh, yeah? What is it now? I am now uh, Enterprise Data and Analytics Chief Data Engineer. Ooh, I like that. Well, it was inspired by the show. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with some really smart people and, you know, in in having some of these conversations, one of the things that emerged was this division that's happening in what we call data science, which is kind of a big umbrella term, but, um, there are more people who are, who are data scientists now who focus on the analytics side of stuff. And then there's folks like me who's doing data integration, data cleansing, data loading, uh, that sort of stuff. And those people are classified uh, in the field as data engineers increasingly. So I thought it was fitting and a little more descriptive to call myself a data engineer. I like that. Um, I actually call myself an applied data scientist um, because I want to be like Buck Woody when I grow up. Well, that's a noble goal on, well, I don't know. I was going to try and put a percentage on the front that that would be, a- <laughs> I'd go with a solid 80 on an 80, 20. I'm, I'm kidding. Buck's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if Buck were here, he would probably say, well, in order to be like me, when you grow up, you can't grow up or something well, like something that. Something like totally that. He would have something really clever and amusing to say. I'm sure. Right. Um, I believe cool. our, our guest today, uh, Audrey Hammonds knows Buck. At least she's familiar with him. I know she's spoken to some of the same venues. Um, Audrey is with Innovative Architects. Audrey, when we get to you, you're going to have to tell us what your title is. I, I'm not sure if it's consultant. Actually, you can tell us now. Do you have a title? Uh, at Innovative Architects, we're actually pretty fast and loose with our titles. So uh, okay. I think my business card says practice lead for business intelligence and analytics. But depending on the day, uh, I actually told someone this morning my official new job title is official mail checker for the West Palm Beach office because um, (laughs) I got a VPN card from a client that sat in the mailbox for a couple of days. So, um, you know, we we adjust and and adapt and overcome. So the job title changes pretty regularly, but my focus is business intelligence and analytics. Very cool. Oh, very cool. Your LinkedIn profile says data services consultant. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not great at updating LinkedIn all the time. So I have to fix <laughs> well, you put you, <laughs> put you safely in the data space. Right. Very cool. Um, well, you've been doing this for about 20 years, data related stuff. Um, I know you're, you mentioned West Palm Beach. You're out of that area. Uh, we actually had this show scheduled and it was postponed because of Hurricane Irma. 
And um, I think you made the right call, uh, you know, choosing to evacuate rather than stay and do the show with us. As much as we would have loved to have you on the show earlier, that's a better decision. Um, you're also the other half of Data Chicks uh, with an X, D A T A C H I X dot com. And uh, we had Julie on the show earlier. And uh, you work at Innovative Architects. Their, their website is innovativearchitects.com. But there's something else that you do. And I know Frank's looking at your LinkedIn profile. So I'm going to throw the other half of the intro over to Frank. Wow, oh, no pressure, though. Let's see. Would that be the Palm Beach Tech Association? Uh, yeah, actually, that is something. Um, so I moved to West Palm Beach from Atlanta. Uh, we opened a new office down here. Innovative Architects did. And, you know, we're, we're really big on community. And one of the things we did was we got involved with the Palm Beach Tech Association, which is a, a countywide organization, you know, doing, doing events and meetups and incubation, supporting entrepreneurs and startups. And uh, this year I was asked to join the board of directors. So uh, that's been really exciting. And it's been a great way to learn about the community and, and support my new home. Uh, and it's an amazing group of people that are uh, spending a lot of volunteer time, you know, supporting uh, technology careers and companies within Palm Beach County. Oh, very cool. So uh, I, one of the things I've, I know it's not exactly Miami, but you're close to Miami. Is there a kind of a Miami tech scene? Um, Miami has uh, the reputation or... for being the hotbed of technology. And then, you know, you come up the, the east coast of Florida and then you've got the Fort Lauderdale area and then Boca Raton and then, you know, West Palm Beach. And then you keep going north and you get what we call Space Coast, which is, you know, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral and all of the organizations that are out there to include these days SpaceX, which is really cool. So West Palm Beach kind of sits right in the middle between all the stuff that's going on with, you know, space exploration and aviation to the north of us to, uh, you know, Miami, which is a more traditional uh, just sort of technology city. So we're trying to figure out what our place is and, and how do we make this a place where, you know, people want to come and, and work and live. I mean, we live at the beach and the weather's beautiful. So uh, there, there's a lot of advantages <laughs> How do we make sure technologists uh, have career opportunities here? And so that's really our focus. Right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense because, um, I mean, certainly um, you could probably throw a job fair in Chicago in January, and I would imagine you get a lot of foot traffic. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, like, you know, you talk about your new home, like what a home it is, too. I mean, it must be beautiful. I mean hurricanes aside it is gorgeous and you know andy mentioned uh when you guys were speaking earlier about the pollen that has been one thing that's been really surprising is coming from atlanta where the pollen is ridiculously bad to hear um the air quality is very different you know i mean my son has a field trip to the beach on friday and it's almost it's almost nice. halloween you know so um the culture is really different and it, it's really diverse and interesting here it's been a lot of fun to make the move and i can stand on my balcony and see the waterway so um, awesome. no complaints cool. on my end no you can't beat no. that at all i actually lived in jacksonville for a few years which is way north of you people don't you know they don't live in florida or not not good with geography and i'll admit i'm not if i hadn't lived there i wouldn't know anything about what you were talking about but I lived in Jacksonville back, um, gosh, it's, uh, it was about 16 years ago and lived there for three and a half years. Uh, Christy and I's first two children were born there in Jacks. And um, you're right about the pollen and it is a completely different atmosphere than being on the mainland. And technically, uh, Jacksonville is, is sort of on the southern end of what you'd consider the mainland, not really the peninsula. Um, but totally agree, totally agree with what you said. And it was we had a joke around uh, the first week in December when it would cool off, you know, the daily temperature average would drop below 75 or something. And we'd say, don't worry, you know, Valentine's Day's, Valentine's Day's coming and it'll warm back up. Oh, yeah. We're having a cold front right here. The low was like 59 this morning and everyone is freaking out. It's, it's, it's fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so reading your bio and uh, I find this very interesting. Some years ago, she volunteered for DBA training to escape COBOL and never looked back. <laughs> that is the truth. So um, I actually ended up in IT via the military. Um, 
quick, slightly embarrassing story. I went to college on a sort of a traditional path uh, for engineering, and that was my goal. And my freshman year, I had a whole lot of fun, not much of it happening in the classroom. And I, I went home after the first few months, and I said, this is not working. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing well in this environment. And I talked to my mom and dad, and I talked to some friends. And I decided to run off and join the Air Force. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew I needed structure and I needed, um, I needed a different path. And so, you know, I went through the whole recruiting process and I took the test. And they said, hey, you're kind of a smart kid. Let's give you this extra test to uh, see if maybe you're good at this logical, procedural kind of stuff. So I took a second set of tests and they came back and they said, um, would you be interested in being a computer programmer? And I had taken one uh, computer class in high school, which was a Turbo Pascal 7.0, I'm dating myself here, um, programming class. And I said, oh, yeah, I can, I can do that. So, you know, I went through the training. I was taught assembly and COBOL and ADA and DB4. And my first duty station, I worked in logistics and I worked on a COBOL system. And um, this was in 1995. And they came around about a year later and they said, you know, we're going to modernize. We're going to go client server, which at the time, ooh, ooh. I know. We were getting off of our, I remember. our mainframe. We were going to go client server and they decided to go with an Oracle back end. And there was a team about, of about 11 programmers and they said, who wants to go to Oracle training? And I was a terrible COBOL programmer. Like for whatever reason, like I was better at assembly than I was at COBOL. It was crazy. So, um. Yeah, wow. I just had like this mental block about it. And so I raised my hand and I said, I'll do it. And so about three of us went and spent almost an entire summer at Oracle training and learning about it. And I fell in love. Like it just for whatever reason, the the way that uh, my brain works or, or my experiences or whatever, uh, data just made sense to me. And so um, that's how I kind of got into it. And, you know, I spent a few years continuing in the military as an Oracle DBA and then switched to SQL Server in 1999 when I went out into the private sector. So uh, it's been a long time since I've written COBOL, but um, here and there as a consultant, I've seen a few lines of COBOL code and it does give me street cred to be able to uh, read it and understand what's going on. So not wasted time, definitely. Interesting. So um, well, it's a good thing you made the switch away from COBOL before Y2K because the call of the easy money probably would have been too hard to ignore. Well, it's interesting. You know, there is actually a huge shortage of COBOL developers and, and any any mainframe developers or any of the languages that just aren't as widely used anymore. There is actually a college. I think it's University of West Georgia. I'd have to fact check that. They actually have a partnership with uh, some companies in Alabama to train up COBOL programmers in college where they're giving scholarships if these, these students will go and learn some COBOL because they literally cannot find COBOL programmers anymore. You know, I, I don't think it from a career path standpoint, it's, it's the smartest move, but you know, if, if you're looking to uh, get a decent hourly rate and find some stability, you know, there's, there are so many systems out there still running uh, those languages. Now, it's funny you mention that. There's a story I heard. I don't know if it's true. Uh, I'm just going to take it as kind of uh, an urban legend. Uh, is that the NYPD had, a, as recently as about five years ago, had a system that um, they supposedly would would send a, a police cruiser up to um, up to a retirement home up in Westchester County, New York, uh, and then drive a gentleman down who worked on the system. Uh, and he was the only one that understood it or knew how to work it. it was all I can COBOL. believe that. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, it's just plausible enough that, yeah, it could happen. But, you know, it, there's not a lot of hard evidence in terms of uh, what you can find online about does that really happen. But I heard that from someone who uh, who claimed to work for the, uh, the IT department. So uh, it's interesting. Plus, the other question I had is what what you said you went to college to be an engineer. What what uh, engineering specialty did you have in mind if you had one? Biomedical engineering. Ooh, Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I, I had uh, actually my computer science teacher who in high school who is still there, actually. She is uh, still part of the uh, administrative staff. Um, 
she was really great about taking us out to events and stuff like that. And the Texas A&M University, I grew up in Texas, had a, a high school engineering conference. And we got to go and visit all of the different graduate programs they had. This was my senior year of high school. And the biomedical engineering department was building toys for children who had prosthetic limbs. And they were using their engineering skills to create fun toys that would help these kids learn how to use their new prosthesis. And I went, that's cool, you know, because I love math, I love science, I love technology. And to take something like that and then figure out a way to apply it in a way that is helping people, like that just resonated with me. And so, um, even though it, it didn't work out long term, uh, that's sort of a principle that I, I still carry is, you know, how is the technology actually helping a person, not necessarily just there for the sake of being there. So, Frank, I love you said like earlier, like applied data science. It's not just data science for the sake of data science, but it's applied. What are we going to do with it? You know, right, right. Well, a lot of the data science core concepts have been around academia for at least 20 years. I mean, I took a. Um... I took a uh, an artificial intelligence class, and I think the language we studied was Prolog. Oh yeah, um, cool. Which I I don't know. I remember seeing it like it's not really that intelligent. Like I was expect maybe my expectations were too high, but I think it also harkens back to something you said, where it's like there was a time when now everyone's all about STEM this, STEM that, or computer engineering, computer programmer this. There was a time when that was not considered or is questionable whether or not that was going to be a viable career path. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I took a computer programming class in high school and it never occurred to me that that might be something I would do for a living. You know, I mean, it just, uh, and people just weren't really sure, you know, and it, there was a, um, and there still is some today, there was sort of a perception that there's just a certain kind of person that does that kind of work. And, uh, I didn't think I fit into that mold at the time. So it just, it never occurred to me to be a part of it. Yeah. Weird, weird people. I think that was what my mom said. Yeah. Those guys that hide in the closet, yeah. you know, that stereotype of the guy who hides in the closet and eats nothing but Doritos and drinks Mountain Dew and doesn't speak to anybody. Um, it's a little dated. Hey, hey, hey I'm right. <laughs> yeah, Andy's here. Andy's right here. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> Okay, I'll go back. Y'all no, are on a roll. I'm just going to Andy, that doesn't call. describe you. I've never once seen you eat Doritos. That's, that's <laughs> true. Yes, but the rest. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I have to tell you a story. So um, uh, it wasn't that long ago. Tim Mitchell and I were working together. And the, uh, Microsoft, um, they released as open source some of the .NET languages. And they uh, one of them that that they open sourced, of course, was uh, VB. And at the time, I was bigger on VB than I am right now. It's not that I don't like it, but I've done basic programming since 1975. I mean, I started VB version two. And uh, so he was always picking on me about Visual Basic and not being a real language. And he said something like, well, you know, real developers can get excited now that this is open source. And the VB developers can uh, get permission from their moms to come out of the basement. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, that was, that was pretty awesome. But what I did was I called my mom, gave her Tim's cell number and a script to kind of read through, to talk through this stuff. And he called, he's on a bus uh, riding around an airport, getting ready to catch a flight when she calls. And uh, she told him that, that I have her permission to come out of the basement and to be excited about VB being open source. <laughs> That is spectacular. Andy, you are good at arranging these phone calls. Can I, can I tell my story about the Andy Leonard phone call? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, okay. Frank, you're going to love I this don't. story. So <laughs> working for Innovative Architects, I was working with a client uh, actually in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm working with the team. And uh, we were working on an SSIS uh, framework and, you know, integration work. And um, somebody on the team pulled out a book that – Andy Leonard had helped write and said, you know, well, Andy Leonard says, blah, blah, blah. And I said, absolutely. Yeah. Andy's, Andy's a great guy. He knows what he's doing. And he said, well, you sound like, you know, him. 
And I'm like, oh no, act. and I, not even realizing I was name dropping somebody very, very important. I said, no, Andy's a great guy. We know we know each other very well. And the look of skepticism, everybody's like, who is this person pretending to know the guy who, you know, taught me SSIS? And so um, I told this story to Julie, and I think Julie, I think maybe I shared it with Andy. And then Andy and Julie arranged for, uh, they figured out, Julie checked my calendar, figured out when my next meeting with these guys was, and had Andy call me in the middle of the meeting to ask a question about SSIS. <laughs> that's awesome and so i get the, i get this i'm like and andy doesn't call me that often so i look at my phone I'm like i'm sorry guys I, I need to get this like maybe you know we're all a pretty tight community maybe there's an emergency or something and uh andy's like oh you know i have i i you know i have a question for you and um he's like are you busy and i'm like i'm like andy i'm actually in a meeting right now you know and he's like oh put me on speaker i'll ask everybody the question so these guys who didn't believe that i knew the famous andy leonard uh, we're just floored, absolutely floored, because Andy was calling me to ask me a question about something to do with. I think it was like uh, pro- I think that I think it was like project deployment models in SSIS or something. It was so funny and such a great example of what our community is like. <laughs> it is, and and you know that there's there's a lot of aspects to that story that um, I, I'm like you. I find it hilarious. Um, you know that that. First off, it's for me. It's it's crazy to me that anybody would get excited about, um, you know, about, about anything to do with me. And I've, I've had, you know, these kinds of conversations with people before. Like somebody came up and asked me to autograph a book for the first time. I laughed at them. And I was like, <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, uh, people will be doing whatever, you know, saying whatever, and I'll. I'll tell them I've been trapped in here with me for decades. I'm not impressed. <laughs> so I, you know, I know me, but the other side of that, Audrey is, is some stuff that's actually been getting some attention lately. And, and, it, and I'm glad actually that it is. And it's the way um, females are being treated in our industry. And I'm, uh, I'm floored and, um, and, and proud of the, the females that are standing up, the ladies that are standing up and, and, and helping raise awareness of stuff like that. And, you know, I know some of what you ran into uh, was cultural and the people weren't, it wasn't any, in, um, at least conscious intention behind it. Um, but at the same time, it was, uh, you know, on the, I guess on the other side, it was a really good joke. And I appreciated Julie's help setting that call. up. Oh, no, it, it was, it was great. And you, you do bring up a good point. You know, I mean, Andy, I saw you, uh, you, I think liked a Facebook post that I had put up um, pretty recently talking about that issue. And I think it's important to have a conversation about, you know, perceptions of, of people on the surface versus, you know, maybe reality and things like that. It's um, IT is an industry that's, that's growing and changing so fast that it, it can be tough to uh, keep up and it can be tough to adjust culture as we adjust you know, the reality and the logistics of how we, how we actually work today. No, that's true. And I, no, you're right. I did. Go ahead. No, I think that's true. I think there was a time when, when computers were locked in basements, when it really attracted the introverts. Uh, but now the computering is social. It's everywhere. It's, it's ubiquitous. Um, it affects all kinds of people. And, it's it's going to need all kinds of people to engineer and craft solutions for all kinds of people. Absolutely. Yep, I completely concur uh, on that. And it's you know it's it's painful. Change is is sometimes painful uh, for folks, and um, I certainly get that. Um, I, I find it uh, as a as a father of uh, three daughters and a grandfather of three granddaughters it uh some of the stuff i'm i'm seeing and and really getting a sense of i guess how you know how ubiquitous uh, some of the treatment of women is in our industry it's just it's eye-opening to me um did i know it happened before yes did i know it happened to people i knew not as many i mean i can do the math right i'm i'm okay at statistics and when you say one in four uh, women have faced some kind of discrimination or some kind of harassment. You know, it's easy to look at that number and go, well, that's just a number. But when you see a lot of people 
that you respect and, and care about and, and even love, uh, type in me too. It changes the dynamic, at least for me. So it's been, uh, it's been very eye-opening and um, I've actually added quite a few people to my prayer list as a result. And that, that's good to hear. No, I think, um, and again, the most important thing is, is to keep talking about it. And as a woman in IT, uh, which has been getting a lot of attention lately out in the in national media, um, I think that uh, it's, it's important to talk about, and it's a double-edged sword, right? Like, I want to present myself as someone who is strong and capable and can take care of myself and doesn't have to ask for help and all of those things. And then at the same time, if I'm just shrugging off or ignoring or setting aside uh, things that I see and observe or experience, then I'm not doing anybody any favors. So it's, it's difficult to stand up and say, right. hey, you know, you're not the only one this is happening to. And I think what, what's been happening in Hollywood has, been, has set such a, such a good precedent and pattern around, you know, really famous actresses and people in that industry coming forward and saying it's not just the, the D-list stars, you know. It's not just the interns and the young kids. Right. Um, being someone who has been in this industry for 20 years, I, I think I've come to realize that I have a responsibility to um, to say something, if that makes sense. It does, and it's not just because you've been in this in industry, Audrey. I mean, you're a oh, leader thank you. in this industry, whether you are comfortable with that or not. And, uh, and I have learned some SSIS tips and tricks from you, even though I... You didn't tell me anything new on that phone call with the team. So. Although I do, uh, you are, we are going to have to talk offline. If anybody can help me figure out how to take a file out of OneDrive for Business and get it into something else via, via SSIS, that, that's my latest uh, conundrum. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I'm working on today. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. I'll be happy to, uh, to dive in there with you. I've never done that. But yeah, so exciting. actually, uh, just speaking tech, tech for just a second, um, Office 365 has a tool called Microsoft Flow, which is like a workflow automation thing that doesn't seem to be getting a lot of attention, but it's really cool. And so we've got a process where we're getting emailed a file, and I'm using Microsoft Flow, sort of like a front-end ETL tool, to grab that file and get it into OneDrive for Business. And I went, woo, I got that to work. And then I went, oh, now I have to get it out of OneDrive for Business. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's fun. It's, it's always a new problem every day, so... That's interesting. That's what makes it exciting is that there's always a new problem. It is. I get bored easily. And that's one of the things I love about my job and I love about being a consultant is um, it is literally something new every day and probably two or three something something's new every day. So uh, I don't know if I'd do well with a job where I had the same routine day in and day out. I think most smart people would lose their mind in that situation because, you know, the, I think – I think that to, to to start in this industry, you have to be curious. To stay in this um, uh, industry, you have to really want to learn. And I tell that. Like, so I've been in situations where I, you know, they want me to talk to high school kids or college kids, and you know, encourage them into a career in in computer science. And uh, you know, I always say, like, you know, if you don't like learning this is a really terrible field to be in. That is the truth. Um, you know, in these days, uh, Julie and I talk about this a lot. Um, these days it feels like we have to learn faster and faster and faster all the time. It's uh, you used to be able to get away with uh, knowing a little bit of SQL and maybe a little bit of the BI stack and a little bit of, you know, data modeling. And um, those days are gone. You know, I mean, we, we have to we have to not only stay up with what's going on in our industry, but we are we are constantly learning new ways of doing things. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I and mean, particularly with this um, right now, I'm learning uh, CNTK, which is I'm using more calculus and math, I think, in the last two weeks than I had in the last 30 <laughs> years. Oh, I don't know if I'd be able to uh, pick that back up. That would be a tough one. Oh, if any, you can do it. I have faith in you. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. But, but, uh, but I mean, it just speaks to the thing. Like, you know, if you told me, you know, three years ago, I would be working on your image recognition systems or I'm like, no, you're, you're, you're crazy. Uh, 
I just, it's just amazing how quickly things can turn. And I think that the pace of innovation in the space and the importance of data to society, uh, not just the business world, but I mean, to society and a lot of the things that are being, um, being done in, in this space in terms of predictive analytics and predicting crime and predicting customer behavior. It's just the ethic, ethical implications of this are just enormous. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I used to have to like explain to people what I did for a living. And now when I say I work in data, I don't get questions about what I do. I get questions about my opinions on certain things, cybersecurity or data breaches <laughs> or AI or, you know, our, you know, um, but I think I read a, a story recently about what would be the impact of your ability to hack, say, the control system on a on a tank that's that's in a in a in a battle zone. You know, I mean, even things like warfare are completely changing because we're having to think about how to use the data that we have, how to create good data for analytics, and then how to protect, you know, the data that's out there. And I think that's the one that the the I mean, we've all been in this business for a long time. We know there are databases out there with really sensitive data in them that just aren't being properly cared for. And with the just explosion of data, it just, it makes me nervous. It's like, wow, you know, there's, there's a lot of data out there that can, that can do a lot of good or a lot of harm. And, you know, there, there are people out there, they're going to take advantage of that. So um, it's, it's been, it's been an interesting evolution over the last few years. No, and you're absolutely right. I mean, and the, the changing nature of warfare. I mean, you know, you know, I'm not going to mention anything by name, but I mean, clearly geopolitical tensions are pretty high these mm -hmm. days. And, um, you know, uh, I remember hearing on the news on the same day, I think one of the major airlines had a, uh, uh, the reservation systems had crashed. There was an issue with, uh, the stock exchange. Um, and, um, uh, something else happened too. And, and everyone's saying, no, 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 this is all random. It's all random. It's like, but, but this is what a cyber war would right. look like. You know, um, it, it's just interesting how, uh, the home front would be kind of everywhere you have a, a cell phone signal or an internet connection. It, 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 it the mind boggles at what that means for the future of societies. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, it's, um, we think of, of technology as so permanent, um, you know, but who knows what it looks like five years from now or 10 years from now or 50 years from now. And, um, you know, like Elon Musk came out and gave this big sort of warning about the dangers of AI and everybody immediately went to Terminator because, you know, that's, that's our point of reference is, is Skynet and Terminator. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's, and I think being people in the industry, we, we see some of the, the frailty of some of what we work with and we see some of the, the, um, the gaps in the, the systems and things like that. So I think, you know, this is sort of like the space race, right? Like, Who's gonna Who's gonna get to the moon first? This is This is who's gonna have the best AI first. Maybe the next big, um, you know, not world domination, but who the superpowers may not be defined by military might so much anymore. They may be defined by who has the best, you know, and an analytics and technology solutions. No, absolutely. I mean, if you think about um, historically what power has meant, historically power used to mean how much land you had. And how many how many people you had work in the land, whether they were serfs or otherwise, um, and then power became kind of shifted to the, the the merchant class, where basically money was the power. And I I think we're on the beginning of the of the changeover from money being power to data being power. It's been a pleasant surprise, considering I totally stumbled into this career. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right, but, right, right, right. No, you're absolutely right. And you, you mentioned the whole data is the new oil thing. And I, uh, I read the article in The Economist that talked about that. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's interesting. And I love that people who aren't necessarily part of this industry are starting to get it and understand. You know, um, being a veteran, I, um, I'm involved with some veterans organizations. So I have a lot of friends who, you know, they served during Korea and Vietnam. And, and they're in their, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s now. And it is just fascinating to um, to watch the the learning process for the generations that you know didn't grow up 
with with cell phones and computers and internet and all of those things. And um, like a buddy of mine, he's in his seventies and he was telling me a story about his Uber driver the other day. And I'm, you know, I was struck. I'm like, this guy, he didn't have a smartphone two years ago and now he's using ride sharing platforms and not thinking twice about it, you know? And so it's just so fascinating to see how, you know, platforms like, like Twitter and Facebook or tools like Uber or Amazon and things like that are just sort of leveling the playing field across the board and creating an awareness sort of globally of what technology is and what it does. You know, I mean, um, it, it's, it's really fascinating to me. And I, I would love to, um, you know, like you mentioned, the whole, all the ethics of data and all of that stuff. Like, I think there's, there's a lot of Wild West still happening. It'd be, it's, it's fascinating to see how it's going to evolve over the next few years. No, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Cool. Well, uh, Audrey, we have some questions that we like to ask people. You, you've already answered uh, uh, the first one for sure about how did you find your way into data. Uh, great oh. story, by the way. And thank you thank for you. serving in the military. That's awesome. Um, so what's your favorite part of your current gig with Innovative Architects? Um, so right now, uh, we actually have a contract with a company out at Kennedy Space Center. So I actually spent the last two days up at Kennedy training data analysts to use Power BI. Oh, and wow. it, it's been uh, a lot of fun. And I think, um, you know, what I love is, is helping create solutions that empower people and sitting at a table with six data analysts who are helping Kennedy Space Center run smoothly and taking their Excel spreadsheets and their, their Power View reports and their SSRS reports and sitting down and saying, okay, here's this Power BI platform. Let's all learn it together. You know, and watching analysts who have been working out there for you know, 20 years and who have, um, have had somewhat limited tools in, in their, their jobs and watching just sort of honestly, and it sounds so hokey but sheer joy on their faces when they're going wait i can just put this on this screen and publish it and people are going to be able to just get to it and see it and i don't have to email the report and i can create my own filtering mechanisms and i can i, ha I had one one woman who um start immediately jumped in to uh m or power query at writing an if statement to create a custom column and so for me it's um it's enabling people. It's it's helping people learn how to use the tools that are out there. So that's that's what I get my kicks from. Uh, so complete this sentence. Uh, when I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Do I only can I only give one, or can I give you a list? Why don't we keep it a list of five? Top five. Top five. Okay, spending time with my family. I have a wonderful husband, Jeremy, and and two kids, Chase and Gavin. Uh, we, we love to hang out and spend time together, uh, watching English premier league soccer. I am a huge Everton supporter. It's been a rough season for us so far, but, uh, we just fired our coach or our manager and, uh, we played Chelsea at two forty five today. So, uh, we'll see how, how we do with the interim manager. Uh, I read a lot. Um, that is if, if I had only one thing that I could do. For the rest of my life, it would probably be read books. Um, I'm a knitter, which is um, kind of random, but I love to knit. It relaxes me. And uh, we like to travel when we can. Was that five? I wasn't keeping count. I'm so sorry. It's, it's close may, enough. I may it's, have gone over. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, so the next question then is uh, another completed sentence. I think the coolest thing in technology today is blank. I think the coolest thing in technology today is augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, I think it's just starting to emerge, but I am really fascinated to see uh, where we're going to head with that. Yeah, I could see that, uh, particularly in terms of data visualization. Yep. Oh, yeah. So one of the things, uh, when I give a presentation on um, 
um, Power BI and data warehousing and stuff like that, or Data Lake, I always try to work in this one image. You remember the really bad movie Hackers from like the 90s where Angelina Jolie and Johnny Lee Miller were like skateboarding punk kids who like took down the man with the hacking. Are you guys familiar with this movie? Yeah, I remember that movie. I am. Yeah, well, there's this one scene, I think it's Lorraine Baracco, the actress, is she's the bad guy. And she's like, we need to get into the data warehouse. And she walks into this room that is full of cubes of light. And she's like walking through them looking for the data. It was like the mer- movie version of, you know, querying the database. But I love the idea of somebody being able to walk into their data or maybe walk into a visualization or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, It'll be interesting to see where, where it all goes. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Definitely interesting. Um, I want to go back to one of the questions Frank asked you, actually one of your answers about um, when you're not working, what you enjoy. You mentioned books and I know just from conversations that you also listen to audio books. Do you, uh, do you have a favorite audio book since audible is a sponsor Ooh, okay so i will tell you that our family are um and I, guys i promise whoever's listening to this this was this is not scripted we have been audible members since before they were bought by amazon uh we use um we use audible on all of our road trips uh everyone listens to audible books and um my favorite is the Robert Jordan Wheel of Time series because they've got multi-cast members working on it. Um, oh, wow. Right now, I am listening to a book by Peter Kleins called Paradox Bound, which is this really cool sort of American history time travel story. So, um, yeah, we are huge Audible people. We, we're usually running out of credits by the end of the month, but... Uh, Oh, very cool. No, but it's great. Like, we get in the car and, you know, we can pick a book that our 11-year-old can listen to with us and enjoy, and then we can talk about it. It's actually, um, it's a big part of what we do. That's awesome. Well, we have, um, you know, we've been listening to them here for a while, too. And I actually, uh, I mentioned we homeschool our kids. Um, Stevie Ray is uh, my oldest son. He started listening uh, recently to... uh, (laughs) to some of his books. And he actually shared with me uh, a suggestion for Ready Player One. I don't know if you've listened to that one yet. I actually, I read it. I have not listened to it, but I'm a big fan of the book. Yeah, uh, Will Wheaton did the narration on it. I thought he did a fantastic job. And it was the first book that wasn't like about theology or business that I enjoyed listening to as an audio book. And I've been forever, I've had the Wheel of Time series on my list. So now, you know, I wanted to read it. And now you've mentioned that it's a good audio book. I'm going to pick it up. They're spectacular. I mean, you're talking about 45 to 48 hours per book. So it is an investment in time, but um, wow. they are just spectacularly done. You know, they've got, uh, they've got male narrators and female narrators to cover some of the different points of view in the story. Um, and it, it is my all-time favorite fantasy series, so I'm a little biased, but uh, it is it is a beautifully produced audiobook series. Very cool. So we have another complete this sentence. Okay. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to visit my friends and family uh, virtually and feel like I'm there. Uh, Moving to South Florida uh, has has been a bit of a challenge just from a social standpoint. You know, we lived in Atlanta for 17 years, um, and and most of our friends are there, and most of my family is in Texas. My husband's family is in North Carolina. So, um, you know, video conferencing is great, and phone calls are great and all of that. I would love to see what the next step Mm -hmm. of that is. Could we we get a holodeck type... uh, for all you Star Trek fans, an environment where we can all sit around the table together virtually and hang out. Or a Stargate. That would be pretty cool, too. Stargate would be awesome. <laughs> I'm glad somebody else is a fan of that show. That was a great show. Totally underrated. Absolutely, yeah. I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, we, we've watched them. Um, I think we've gone through all of the different Stargates um, at least once. I want to say maybe twice. And uh, just just recently, we we rewatched the uh, the Battlestar Galactica from uh, about ten years ago. Or oh, so. that was a good series. Um, 
I, I liked it. I know a lot of people complained about the ending. Um, going through it this time, I, we really kind of spread it out across maybe three or four months. It wasn't like Ben's watching. Um, and, and I actually picked up more at the end, stuff that I'd missed, like the mythology and stuff like that. And um, I thought they did a great job first creating it and then portraying it the way they did. And I wasn't uh, as offended by the ending as I think some people were. I kind of liked it when it first came out. But there's some mystery there, you know, so I like that. I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have any other questions for me? We do. Uh, we have the, the zinger. Uh, we ask that you share something different about yourself with this caveat. It's a family podcast. Well, that puts a lot of limitations on it. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll save that for uh, Data Driven After Dark. There you go. Uh, something different about myself. So um, I am actually going back to college next semester. And it's sort of a funny story. Um, I have decided to go back to school for an English literature degree. And... Um, it's been an interesting process. So I, you know, I, I called the admissions advisor at the school, and he's got his script and his expectations. And he said, well, what kind of career are you looking for? And I said, oh, I'm not looking for a new career. I just want the degree. And he, he sort of he pulled up short. He was like, what? I said, no, I've got a great job. I love my career. I make good money, all those things. I said, I just want this degree. And he's like, so you're just going to go back to school to just get a degree, but you're not worried about getting a job? Nope, nope. I just want to get the degree. I, like I said, I love reading. I love creative writing. So um, I'm actually going to start working my. I, I I never did finish my bachelor's. You know, I, I ran off and joined the military and was able to step out into an awesome career. So it's on my my personal bucket list is to get a bachelor's degree. And I've decided that um, you know at my at this point in my career, uh, I don't want a computer science degree. I don't think it it would do much to advance my career or be a whole lot of fun to spend my work day right. looking at this stuff and then study it in the evenings. So, uh, so yeah, I'm going back to school, which is uh, sort of an interesting process when you're 40 something years old. That is, uh, that's interesting. And I, I congr you know, kudos to you and congratulations. That's a awesome way to, uh, that's an awesome thing to do. And I, I'm, I'm proud of you, Audrey. That's uh, that's pretty. Thank cool. you. Talk to me when I've got finals coming up and a deadline to meet. We'll see how that goes. But uh, I'm excited I'm about it so it. far, and I can do a lot of the classes online. So hopefully, I can work it into my schedule. It'll be logistically, it'll be interesting, but um, I feel like I'm at a place where I can do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can. Um, it's it's interesting you mentioned some of the stuff about creative writing. Are you? Are you thinking about maybe doing some, I know you've done technical writing. Are you thinking about doing some more creative type writing, some, some fiction? So um, I'm a closet writer. Um, the, okay. the program I'm actually uh, trying to work my way into is an in English literature with a minor in creative writing. And uh, my goal at some point is to write something that other people want to read. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, um, of fantasy and science fiction and I'm, I've convinced myself, based on some bad fantasy and science fiction, that I could do that too. So maybe someday, I'll figure out how to uh, how to put something out there that could potentially be published. But it's a tough industry, and I, you know, I'm, when you sit down and try to write, and then you you realize how difficult it is, it gives you a whole new level of respect for people who do it for a living. Um, creativity is. Uh, is not something that just you sit down at the, at the desk and go, okay, today I'm going to be creative and come up with a great plot line or something like that. So um, it, I think it's a, it's a hard career, which is why I wouldn't want my family's livelihood to depend on it, but it is, it is a personal goal. Maybe at some point I can figure out how to, to write something interesting enough that other people want to read it. Well, it's not unprecedented in our field. I know um, Randy Dias, who's a database person, SQL mm, Server yeah, person. I've he's met written him. Some, some uh, sci-fi. Yeah, he's done. And I, I read, uh, I think I read one of them. And I didn't good. know that. I'm going to have to go find his stuff. Yeah, he's written, I want to say it's two or three. 
And the first one I read, I thought it was good. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't Dune or, <laughs> you know, but, but it wasn't, it, it also didn't fit into that genre. You know, I know what you're talking about, about people who've written kind of bad sci-fi. It definitely wasn't that. Um, and I, you know, for the first published work I'd ever seen uh, from him, I thought it was really good. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it seems like something that is, uh, is really difficult to do and it takes a lot of commitment, but, um, you know, someday and, and someday, um, you know, maybe I decide to, to slow down on the IT stuff and, and focus on something different. I think I'm a long way away from that, but you know, I think, I think it'd be fun. I was, I was also thinking of, um, um, Mark and I can't, it begins with an R. I always mess his name up when I try to say Rusinovich, maybe. Um, who wrote, he wrote Zero Day. And I, I heard rumors they were thinking about making a movie out of that one. Yeah. Really? Oh, that's cool. I don't think I've read that. I'll it's have to look. Interesting... I forget what I've read. I have to go back and check my Goodreads account <laughs> to see what I've actually read. Yeah, he's... Because... And, and those were, those were, you know, I thought those were great, great books too. He wrote, wrote three in that, um with that main character of his. I can't remember the name of the character, but it was really good. And, you know, given Mark's background, I, I forget what he is now. I think he was leading Azure or he was a fellow and all of that stuff at Microsoft. Really smart guy. And um, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to things like cybersecurity. And that's what he was, his, his character, the main character, the, uh, the protagonist, um, does that kind of work. He does cybersecurity. So uh, interesting reading from someone who does it in real life. And I don't know, maybe maybe you could write some stuff about a protagonist who's uh, big into data analytics or database or, or maybe even COBOL. There we go. <laughs> the heroine who is also the COBOL programmer. <laughs> I'll have to come up with something. Who's still trying to get her kid to Taekwondo on time and... Uh, Get dinner on the table. It can't get the syntax right for this stinking loop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I, I was doing training yesterday with these data analysts. And, you know, you go, you go into a client and you want to look like the expert. And she asked me how to write an if statement in Power Query. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I know how to write an if statement in about eight different languages, but I cannot remember the exact syntax for this one. And she was... It was it was a funny moment because I said I said I'm sorry I said I hope you you aren't offended by this but I'm going to go Google that <laughs> and make sure I've got it right and I think it was this moment of like oh you don't know it either and it's like well I know what needs to happen I do not have room in my brain to to keep up with all of that stuff so uh, thank you so much of this you know maybe a, a, I mean you know people think you know we we had the conversation earlier you know about. Um, the people who were impressed that you knew me and stuff. And it's like, like if y'all only knew. Uh, <laughs> you know, I know, I'm I know. SSIS and I, it's, stuff all the time. And it's the same thing. You can't keep all of this in your head anymore. And, you know, I usually find myself, I beat my head against the monitor for several minutes, way too long. And then this thought will pop into my brain. It's like somebody has run into this problem before. So, and I'll make this really quick, Andy. You know, we, we were talking about people being willing to sort of stand up and talk about things that are hard to talk about. I think it's really important as, as sort of senior people in this business to stand up and say, I don't always know what I'm doing. You know, we all want to present ourselves as these experts. And I think there's some, there's some power and some liberation in saying, I had to look that up this morning or I had to call somebody or I was stuck on that for two days. And, right. you know, I think it's important to be honest about the fact that, uh, I think Paul Randall said it best. Uh, you know, there is no expert. Right. Like, stop it. Stop calling yourself an expert because we're not. Exactly. You know, we're all learning. We're all trying to figure it out. We're all stumped on something at all times, which, you know, can be a little terrifying. And if you're not comfortable with not knowing what you're doing sometimes, maybe this isn't the best career. You've got to be willing to, to fail many, many times before you uh, get it right. Preach that. I tell you, <laughs> that is so true. And... <laughs> You know, I think part of it, too, in consulting is, you know, people will look at consultants and say, you know, we're paying you more than we would pay someone if we hired them to come work for us. And we're paying for your expertise. And, you know, it's it, it can be a little bit of a, you know, it can be a little bit of a race there where things are kind of running around. But 
what I usually tell people is I, I try and correct them, especially in a consulting engagement, and just let them know, look, I'm experienced. I don't really consider myself an expert because I'm learning new stuff every day. And you know, I completely agree with what Paul said and, and with what you said, too. It's just, you know, it, it's just not possible to hold all this in your head. And I think what you did for your client, Audrey, was you delivered some real value to them when you showed them that somebody who's as smart as you at this, who's as good as you, who knows this as well as you do, had to stop and look it up. I think what you did was you tore down this artificial wall, uh, maybe in their minds that, you know, I'm going to have to learn this and know it all like the back of my hand in order to be good at it. And that's just simply not the case. They, they probably brought a lot of the stuff, probably all of the stuff into the room with them that are going to make them good at their career. They just needed to know how to make it work in Power BI. I appreciate that. Thank you. I hope that was the takeaway. Um, it remains to be seen, but um, for the most part, I found that people appreciate uh, being just really straightforward about what you know and what you don't know. And um, so far, that's worked for me. Yeah, same so. here. It's why I type in yep. demos. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fail. I'll, ultimately, if you're you know this, if you're doing SSIS and you're typing in a demo, you're gonna have you're gonna have an error. <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely. I, I did it. I was in, I was demoing Power BI on Monday and I, I got myself turned around and there's a couple of things in that, in the desktop UI that aren't so intuitive. And right. I had to stop and go, where am I at again? Okay. Yeah. We, I think I know what I'm doing and had to back out and get back in. And, you know, I think especially for people who are newer to the industry, like they need to see that they need to see that um, none of us are perfect. That's true. Yeah, we're all trying. And I think it's also a big part of the community. Like, you know, you tell people you have expertise. One thing I tell people a lot is I don't I may not know the answer, but I bet I know somebody to call who does know the answer. Absolutely. And that's one of the great things about the, the how tight knit our data community has has become is that um, there does seem to be a sense among most of us of just let's all help each other out. And, and you know, rising waters and boats and all those cliches. Exactly. Yeah, I love the term SQL family. I think that's that's an apt description. It really is, yeah. And, um, you know, I, it's it's funny to tell people who aren't part of it. I try to explain it to people. It's like I, I finally told one person, I said, I could go to almost any major city in the world and find somebody to go have a beer with. And they're like, oh, you're exaggerating. I'm like, not really. No. Yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, I've got an acquaintance somewhere in that country, probably, yeah. you know, and it's just um, for a girl who grew up in a small town in Texas, you know, and uh, sort of stumbled into this career. I think I've said that a couple of times, but to to have, you know, sort of been embraced by this this whole network of people is just it makes you appreciate the uh, the experience you're having, even though it's, you know, it's what pays the bills. Absolutely. Well, where can our listeners learn more about you? And what you do. So um, you can go to datachicks.com. Uh, Julie and I have a post out there and some bio information. Innovativearchitects.com is where um, I work. And, you know, that's where you can find information about our company. Obviously, we always love hearing about people's problems and how we can help them. Um, if you're in South Florida or, or in Florida in general, uh, look up the Palm Beach Tech Association. Uh, it's something I'm very passionate about. And then obviously LinkedIn.com. Um, that's a way to, to actually get in touch with me if uh, you'd like to. Very good. Well, this has been an outstanding show. Thank you for taking so much time and chatting with us. Um, I'm glad we were able to do this, especially when we got sidetracked by the weather. And so... Thank you very much, Audrey, for being on the show today. Oh, no, Andy and Frank, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Anytime, anytime you guys need somebody to talk to, just give me a call. We look forward to it. Thanks so much, Audrey. Uh, we're going to turn it over to the nice British lady. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.